There were many folks in the life of the only female member of Les Cis who discouraged her from composing, but she did not listen to them. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Germaine Théaffaire. Marcel Germain Théaffès, not Théaffaire yet, was born in April 1892 in the Parisian suburbs to a deeply unhappy couple. Her mother, Marie Desiree Théaffès, was forced by her father into marrying a random Théaffès that he had met on a train in order to preserve the family name. He even hid letters from her then fiancé in order to manipulate them into marrying. Germaine contracted cholera as a baby, as she was born in the middle of an epidemic, and she was the youngest of five, growing up in a house where she was terrified of her parents' often vicious arguments. Germaine was skilled and accomplished at the piano as a child, but she wanted to study drawing for a time instead. After a family friend convinced her that she needed to study music, her father Arthur got so incensed that he told her that she needed to stay away from music. He said straight up that he was not going to support his daughter's musical career because he thought that women in music were no better than prostitutes. Which raises the question, Arthur, my dude, what concerts were you going to? So to see if Germain was good enough to make it into the Petit Conservatoire, Marie Desiree had to sneak her over there for her entrance exams. And she got in, which meant that she needed to have some kind of cover every day for several years. With the help of local nuns who waited and watched for Arthur's departure and then ferried Germaine over to the conservatoire, they were able to keep her attendance at the school under wraps from her father for two years. Germaine was forced to practice the piano in secret for as long as she was secretly attending the conservatoire. But eventually news got out that she was good because the newspaper announced that she had won the first prize in Solfege. And from then on, her father was very proud of his daughter's accomplishments. However, he still refused to support her financially. She had to take on her own students as a teenager just so she could fund her education. This fed her independent streak and her lifelong dismissal of what men thought of her behavior. In 1913, she got a pilot's license to go up in a hot air balloon, and so she took her brother and her harmony teacher up into a vicious thunderstorm. There was one instance during her time at the Conservatoire where, for a jury, she had to play a Bach fugue. And after she played through it, Gabrielle Faure brought to her attention that she had unintentionally transposed the piece. Very early on into the 20th century, Germaine joined her sisters and her mother in legally changing her name from Teafes to Teafer. This like of her father Arthur was probably something to do with it, but it also had to do with what the name meant. Teafes came from the old Norman conquest days and it meant butt cutter, whereas Teafer means iron cutter. Maybe the butts were cut with iron, I don't know but I do understand why there was an impetus to change their name. I mean, would I want to go around in my life just introducing myself as Thomas Buttcutter? Teofer had wanted to compose for years. She'd even started an ambitious opera project when she was a kid, and she started to compose before she officially started studying it at the Conservatoire. At the Conservatoire, Teofer studied the harp, and she wrote pedagogical pieces for that instrument. It was at the institution in 1913 that she was in a class with a quorum of Les Cis, Georges Auric, Arthur Oniger, and Darius Mio, whose friendship and support would come to mean a lot to Teofer as she battled feelings of inferiority. Of all the one-on-one -on -one friendships in that eventual group, Mio and Teofer would probably take the cake for closest friends. One of their first projects was a piano reduction of Igor Stravinsky's Petrushka that influenced Teofer so greatly that she did some Stravinsky-like improvisations in organ class and was expelled from said class for her trouble. She would occasionally be a substitute organist, but she suffered from debilitating stage fright and shied away from being a concert pianist. By virtue of her sex, she was one of only a small handful of conservatoire students who were not mobilized for fighting in World War I. This is not to say that it didn't impact her life greatly. It impacted the lives of everyone across Europe. She studied nursing in Paris, and she attended the conservatoire's classes unlimited once a week schedule, down from three times a week. And she had just a handful of classmates. 
including the Swiss Onager and the chronically ill Mio. This class was taught by Charles-Marie Vidor. To augment their limited time together, these composers hung out at Mio's apartment. The friends would study Schoenberg and Ravel until 1917, when all classes were cancelled and Mio became Paul Claudel's assistant. As the Central Powers indiscriminately shellacked Paris, it forced a lot of women and children especially out of the city, and this is why Taillefer spent a good deal of her time towards the end of the war in Brittany. While this marked the end of her time at the Conservatoire, she continued to study privately until 1923, with the composer and theorist Charles Coquelin, who would also come to teach Francis Poulenc. It took a while for Théophère to gain more confidence in herself as a musician. The first event of note was the death of her father Arthur, which the family was, let's be honest, just totally relieved by. And the second was a chance meeting with Eric Satie in 1917, where the older eccentric called her his musical daughter for her playful interpretation of children's games in her piece Jour de plein air. Satie welcomed her as a member of his unofficial new youths of himself, Auric, Dure, and Doniger. You'll recall that she already knew two of these three, and she was finally given a forum for performances of her works. She also had frequent contact with Maurice Raval, whom she met in the mid-1920s, and was known to join him on hikes around his estate where they doubtlessly talked shop, but not to the exclusion of anything else. After one particularly grueling eight-and-a-half-mile hike, she played Petrushka for him from memory. Music was her primary passion, but she also loved art, fashion design, needlepoint, basically anything creative. Ravel encouraged her to enter competitions, and while she never won any of them, he always wanted to let her know that he was on her side. They knew each other for about six years, and no one really knows why she broke off this connection around 1930. When Les Cis was established by their collective album De Cis, Henri Collet's 1920 article, and Jean Cocteau's ballet, The Newlyweds on the Eiffel Tower, Théafer was right in the mix, and so well thought of by Louis Duret, who bowed out of the ballet at the last possible moment and from the group itself not long thereafter, that he requested that she write what would have been his contribution to that ballet. It was so late in the game, four days until the premiere, that Mio had to step in to help her orchestrate what she'd written. It's not for a lack of knowledge of orchestration on her part, it was just a matter of time. The riot at the premiere of this ballet broke out while her music was playing, and it got so vicious that it sent her and her mother off to a dressing room to ride it out. To illustrate her orchestral prowess and how varied her works are, let's take a look at two very different pieces for piano and orchestra. The first is a neoclassical concerto, which makes extensive use of old forms in the tradition, and the other is an impressionist ballade that sounds like it could very easily have come from Ravel's pen. Stravinsky, who was doing his own neoclassical thing, recognized the concerto as honest music, more than a mere throwback. The concerto was commissioned by the American patron Winaretta Singer, better known as the Princess Edmund de Polignac, who had come to commission other scores from Lacy's composers, including Poulenc's concerto for two pianos. The impressionist qualities of the ballade failed to curry any favor in England, where she would constantly suffer from poor reviews. Some otherwise even quite positive reviews had backhanded compliments and sexist remarks, which commented on the pretty woman composer as some kind of novelty. One comparison went along these lines, you don't see a dog walking on its hind legs and when you do it's not pretty. Women composing is like this. Just inane stuff, but sadly quite culturally pervasive. French culture's treatment of women was not that good, and the constant belittlement of it, the treating of her as a second-class citizen, contributed to her chronically low self-esteem. Keep in mind that France didn't even allow women to vote until 1944. Even positive reviews would be tinged with sexist comments which would link her music with feminine characteristics and traits. And between the wars especially, women were seen as being needed more at home then than ever before, since France had lost so many young men to the trenches that they needed folks to repopulate. Even the support of Ravel was not immune to making comments like saying that her music was full of feminine charm. The more caustic critics would accuse her of going with whatever direction the wind was blowing within her milieu, and at worst she would be accused of being a puppet for Jean Cocteau's ambitions within the musical sphere. The injustice of this double standard, when you look at the way Théafère was treated against the other members of Les Cis, led Virginia Woolf in her 1929 book A Room of One's Own to write that the woman composer stands where the actress stood 
in the time of Shakespeare. In the fall of 1926, Tefer met the American cartoonist Ralph Barton, fresh off of his third marriage at a party in Manhattan. This was her third trip to the United States as she unsuccessfully sought out a professorship that would provide her with a solid and reliable income. Lesis's cultural moment had not changed her financial situation and her aging mother needed care. She never spoke much English, and Barton's fluent French allowed the two to hit it off so well that, combined with the alcohol doubtless present, Barton proposed marriage to her that very night as he drove her back to her hotel. Tefe was stunned. She could not muster any words in the car, but she agreed the following day after going to one of the mutual friend's houses, and that friend vouched for Barton's character. Why TFS said yes is up for debate, and there's probably a couple of different things at play here. Was it her c'est la vie attitude? Was it the alcohol? Was it her unrequited love for the violinist Jacques Thibault? Was it her desire for a kid, with marriage as the most direct and socially acceptable route to that? She thought she might grow to love him, but she did not. Oddly enough, friends were supportive. Within three weeks, the couple was married in Connecticut, and then off to a new life together in New York City, where TFA was introduced to Barton's remarkable circle of friends, which included H.L. Mencken, Sinclair Lewis, George Gershwin, and Charlie Chaplin, who became fast friends with TFA. He wanted her to score his next film, but TFA turned the tables on him and told him that maybe he should write it, saying that his compositional chops or more than up to the challenge. He did, although Tefer, of necessity mostly, would score about 40 films in her career, securing her finances in the years around World War II. She and Chaplin would often play piano duets, as Chaplin would use Barton's apartment as a way to get away from the hounding press. On one occasion, she and Gershwin played Rhapsody in Blue at their apartment. Barton turned out to be an unsupportive husband. If you're keeping score at home, Tefer was his fourth wife, and he actively discouraged her from composing. Sadly, he would not be the last person in her life who would do that. He worked from home, and he could not stand to hear any music when he did so. At least, that's what he said. When an orchestral version of Jeux de plein air was performed by the Boston Symphony under the baton of Serge Kusevitsky, Chaplin was in attendance and was just blown away. But Barton seethed. He was called Mr. Tefer one too many times. Tefer could be intensely self-critical, but she was indefatigable in the face of men in her life who attempted to control her creative behavior. An attitude of, I might get to tell myself I suck, but you certainly don't. She jumped at the first opportunity she had to relocate with him to Paris in 1927. She thought that her sadness and lack of creativity had to do with her physical location. On the boat ride back, she met the author Paul Claudel, who wanted music from her for a new theatrical project. Tefer was shocked that Claudel didn't ask his one-time assistant Darius Mio for the score, to which Claudel said that he preferred working with women. While Mio gave her the thumbs up, Tefer thought that she wasn't being chosen for this project on her own merits. Probably true based on what Claudel told her. There were very few people in her life who supported her and her music with no reservations, so she didn't have much of a support system going in her favor. She never got the same positive critical response outside of Paris, whose critics largely consisted of performers and composers who did criticism on the side. Although Barton was supportive enough to design the cover page for his wife's harp concertino, his mental health was unraveling. When Tefer told him that she was pregnant, his first reaction was to pull out his gun and offered to shoot her in the stomach to kill the baby, saying that she wouldn't feel anything. She was understandably frightened by this. This was the last straw of his behavior. She went out the door as quickly as she could and hid in the bushes as shots rang out from the house. She then ran to a hotel room that was then occupied by one of Barton's friends, explained the situation, and was sheltered from Barton's wild behavior. With ironic sadness, she lost the baby due to a miscarriage induced by the stress of this episode. When Barton found out that his wife had miscarried and had had to be hospitalized for it, he sent so many flowers to the hospital room that everyone who worked in the hospital thought that he was like the greatest husband ever, and Tefer was like, Oh, I don't think so. They would never see one another again. Tefer filed for divorce, and the increasingly mad Barton returned to New York City where in 1931, he shot himself in the head. 1931 was a momentous year for Tefer's personal life. Her devoted mother, Long Ill, passed away in that year, and also her only child, Françoise, 
was born. Francoise's father, soon to be her second husband, was a lawyer named Jean Leja. Lest you think that TFA would have better luck in her second marriage, no, he was a violent alcoholic who was prone to throwing Francoise down staircases. He hated his wife's career as much as, if not more so, than Barton. He would call her away from her desk for pointless reasons or accidentally spill ink all over her manuscripts. And it's not like she was composing all that much in this era either, because her primary concern was raising her daughter. This dude eventually contracted tuberculosis and he moved to Switzerland for treatment. And they officially stayed married, although separated for some time, all the way until 1955 when he finally filed for divorce because he wanted to get remarried. Tefe was not about to enter the marriage roulette for a third time, considering that all she really wanted was a kid anyway, and she considered adoption, there's no reason that she would have done this a third time now that she actually had a child. When World War II broke out, the situation went from bad to worse. She and her daughter suffered from malnourishment, and in 1942 were able to escape France, and they fled to the United States, where they settled in a suburb just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, near the campus of Swarthmore College. She took a break from composing in this era, not just because she was still concerned about her daughter's upbringing, but because being away from France totally sapped her creative juices. She was still married at this point, and her second husband was working in Washington, D.C., so she didn't have to be subjected to him on a daily basis. She just hated being separated from France, and she never was able to use English that well. She had to use her daughter as an interpreter. She did set a few English texts by Lord Byron, but it wasn't something she was capable of using in conversation, so she always felt a distance from the American culture around her. Contrast this to Darius Mio, who was also in the United States during this period, on the other coast, and Mills College in Oakland, and he could speak English just fine. Mio was more optimistic by nature, and he looked forward to the day that France would be liberated, whereas Tefe didn't even know if France would ever be liberated. When she returned to France a year after the war had ended, she found her house intact, but missing a lot of manuscripts likely burned for fuel when the Nazis used it as a communication center. The 1950s was her most prolific decade, although it was marred by a scandalous operatic flop and a continued problem of not being able to get a lot of her pieces published or performed after their premieres. Pieces from this era include the second piano concerto dedicated to her daughter, who wanted to study with the famous harpsichordist Wanda Landowska, who had commissioned Poulenc for his harpsichord concerto. When she officially divorced Leja in 1956, the money allowed her to move to Saint-Tropez near the reclusive Louis Dure. They would occasionally see one another at the market, but they never made it a point to hang out. She got back into painting and continued her friendship with Poulenc, who would make the journey to visit her fairly often until his untimely death in early 1963 which she learned of when a reporter called her to make a statement. She had a dedicated chair for him, and on one occasion, he asked her daughter and her then-husband Jean-Luc if they would like to accompany him to a gay bar. Poulenc didn't want to go alone, and they decided to tag along with him just to see what it was like. From the time of his death onwards, she found it difficult to even be able to listen to it. Tiafet followed Duray's foray into leftist politics, and joined the French Communist Party in 1968, a year of violent and radical upheaval in French society. Her membership was merely symbolic, as a symbol of solidarity with the student protesters. Also, probably had something to do with the tit-for-tat that she was getting. The party would fund some performances of her works in exchange for her becoming a comrade. She would revoke her membership upon the Soviet Union's disastrous invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Her far-left associations didn't hurt her as much as one might think, because Europe was always a little more open-minded about that kind of stuff versus what was happening, say, with the McCarthy trials here in America. Beyond this political association, she shared something else with Jure, a tendency to modesty and a disengagement from anything that might be considered self-promotion. In the 1970s, she took a post at the Scala Cantorum, the other music school in Paris aside from the Conservatoire. She needed to do this because she wasn't getting a lot of performances of her works, 
and teaching and accompanying were two ways that she could stay in music. 84 year olds don't typically take jobs as accompanists for dancing exercises if they don't have to. She wasn't getting enough money in commissions, she didn't have enough in the bank, and she was now in charge of her granddaughter. Pieces would get a premiere and then they might get published, but subsequent performances were rare. Her career briefly resurged in this period as she wrote original pieces for, or transcribed older pieces for, concert band. She was getting ill. It was rheumatoid arthritis, the same disease that had confined her old friend Darius Mio to a wheelchair for 40 years. Her once national fame had dwindled to a kind of local notability. She could be found often eating dumplings at her favorite local Vietnamese place, or getting some sweet at the local bakery, who named a dessert after her. She died in November 1983, the last living member of a group that had made such a significant mark on French music. She once told Francoise that if she couldn't compose music, there was no reason for her to live. When she died at the age of 91, she'd only stopped composing a month prior. It would have been better to have had married music, she said towards the end. Her music is kind of hard to pin down, both within Les Cis and otherwise. Like Duray and Poulenc, she had an affinity for the Impressionist school that the other members of Les Cis were more stridently against. She also shared an appreciation for J.S. Bach's music with Honecker. A portrait of Bach always hung over her piano. She rarely composed for the same instrumental combination more than twice. Even in her works with the same or similar instrumental combinations, she rarely explored similar ideas within them. And this harkens to what her friend Pablo Picasso once told her, never repeat the same recipe ever. And she thought that this was the best compositional device that she'd ever heard. Although mostly conservative in her tastes, she did experiment with serialism in her clarinet sonata, which sounds nothing like most serial music does. Like Poulenc, she was given to using elements from prior pieces, or build up new pieces by kind of laying them down on top of older works. But unlike Poulenc, who was a very prolific song composer, Tefab didn't think that words and music went together all that well. That is, she didn't think that most pieces which used text had an audible text, unless the member of an audience was looking at the text and reading it along in the program notes, taking themselves out of the experience of music, you weren't going to hear what the folks were singing on stage. It didn't matter if it was a huge chorus or a single soloist. So throughout her career, she wrote a lot of wordless vocal pieces. Scholarship has traditionally ascribed modesty to her, but this might be the modern day equivalent of calling her music full of feminine charm and grace. She had far from her retiring personality and was more than willing to make a fool of herself if the situation called for it. There was one instance where she had this ballet production and unexpectedly she had to do some of the choreography. So she went up on stage and sort of bumbled about and kicked up a bunch of dust and made this enormous noise and all the Dancers thought it was kind of a hoot to see, but they understood what she was going for and what she was trying to express. She was willing to put herself out there like that. She didn't care, and she just had a lot of good fun doing that. She never pretended to care for tradition, and she also didn't think that her music was capital G, capital M, great music. That wasn't a concern for her. She wrote what pleased her, and she did not understand the critics who saw femininity in her works. She was a composer not a woman composer. Despite all the variation from piece to piece, Teofé's music remains an integral part of Les Cis's collective style and a microcosm of it, a uniqueness from piece to piece, and yet overall you can tell that it's a music very much her own and very much worth getting to know. Mm -hmm. 